بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد النبي الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. I would like to welcome our brother Dr. Jeffrey Lang. He is a professor of math in Kansas University at Lawrence. Uh, he is a Muslim now for 10 years. He wrote uh, a book about Islam called Islam from an American Muslim perspective. He also wrote many articles in math, and he was here in Colombia in 1986 and delivered and gave us a uh, very outstanding uh, lectures. And tonight, inshallah, he's going to talk to us about Islam and the purpose of life. It's an honor to have him here. So, Dr. Jeffrey, please. Thanks. <coughs> Can you hear me okay? I, I didn't know I'd be using one of these. <clears throat> oh, it's for the recording. In any case, in the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. Uh, I have my notes here. Uh, Judaism, let me just leave these here for a second. Judaism, I'm sure you all know, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam all have their trace their origins back to the ancient Middle East. And great Middle Eastern personalities, ancient personality, personality, personalities like Moses, uh, Jesus, uh, Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, peace be upon them all, were, are of course, we would expect them to be significant and important to the few and scattered Jewish and Christian communities living in the Arabian Peninsula in the seventh century, the century that saw the birth and rise of Islam. But these same persons and something of their stories seem to also have been important to the vast majority of pagan Arabs living in the Arabian Peninsula at the same time, before the birth of Islam. And the best evidence for that, of course, is the Quran. Because when the Quran speaks about Abraham, or Moses, or Jesus, peace be upon them, it assumes that the audience is somewhat familiar with them. That the, they're, it's not speaking to them about them for the first time. They're not hearing these names for the first time. <clears throat> there have been many theories about how the pagan Arabs in the Arabian Peninsula, before the birth of Islam, came to know about uh, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, some of the biblical characters, something of their stories. And the Orientalists, Western scholars of Islam, have produced many theories and many ideas to try to explain it. The most natural theory, and perhaps the most obvious and easiest explanation, is the one that is most often overlooked. And from our study of the way cultures work, and what we know about the way cultures work this day is oftentimes cultures that are closely related have a lot of sharing of traditions, a lot of sharing of ideas and stories and legends. And since the Jews and the, and the Arabs of the Middle East at that time could trace their origins more or less back to a common source, it should not surprise us at all that many of the stories and traditions that they would have would also go back to a common source. In any case, however it came to be, it's no surprise then that the Quran would use these famous personalities and tell details about their lives to teach its listeners about the oneness of God, ethics, and morality. Essentially, its initial listeners were the pagan, uh, pagan Arabs. Now, Orientalists by Orientalists, I mean basically scholar, Western scholars of Islam. In the latter part of uh, the last century and the early part of this century, have uh, made two accusations about the Quran, two criticisms, in particular about uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now, the Muslims believe that the Quran is a revelation from God. Uh, they believe that Muhammad was inspired by the word of God and that he proclaimed this to his, to whoever would listen, as a matter of fact, over a 23-year career. But Orientalists uh, came to a different conclusion. 
when they studied the Quran and saw these parallels, they made two uh, main accusations. One of the accusations was that Muhammad was a plagiarist, that he was borrowing traditions from the Jewish and Christian community wherever he can possibly find them and incorporating them in what he claimed to be his, his revelations. The second concept developed, and it was slightly more sophisticated than that, is that Muhammad not only was borrowing these, but he didn't seem to understand the religious significance behind them. The, the significance that the Jews and the Christians had come to understand were behind them over their many centuries of thought, over their many uh, centuries of possessing these stories. So for example, and the reason why they believe this is the way the Quran tells the story, say for example, of Moses, or it tells the story of Adam, or it tells the story of Jesus. It tells it in such a way that excludes Jewish and Christian interpretations. For example, the way the story of Adam is told doesn't seem to allow for the concept of original sin. And it doesn't seem to allow for the concept of salvation by some uh, vicarious atonement. Uh, Christian central concepts. And so they felt that when Muhammad, peace be upon him, came upon these stories, he didn't really quite understand the religious depth of them. And so when he used them in his proclamations, he somehow didn't realize that and told them in such a way that didn't allow for the usual understandings. Well, Orientalism matured. And as it matured, we start to see Orientalist thought moving away from that idea. And in the middle of this century, we find a great Orientalist scholar by the name of H.A.R. Gibb, considered one of the very best of his uh, group. In the middle of this century in his book, Mohammedanism, which is something of an insult, the title, to Muslims, but that's beside the point. In his book, he mentioned that these two criticisms you have to be very cautious about. And the reason why he said this is because if any time you find a parallel between a story in the Quran and a story in the Bible, for example, or the Jewish tra Christian tradition. He said almost any time you find that, you'll find many key differences. Many key differences. Now, the fact that there are many differences excludes the possibility that the author of the Quran, by the way, who Muslims believe is God, ultimately, it excludes the possibility that the author simply lifted them from the other tradition. Or there wouldn't be so many differences. Key differences is the key word there, though. These were not just superficial differences. These were not just surface differences, differences in detail. They were key differences in that the way these stories were told, these differences forced an entirely different meaning. So they brought out an original meaning. Muslims might even say the original meaning, but we're not gonna discuss that. But the way they were told brought out an original meaning, a new perspective, a new interpretation. So from H.R. Gibbs' point of view, the point wasn't whether the Quran was dealing with the Jewish Christian interpretation or not. He said that, that should even, that's not even the point. The point is that the Quran, when it uses these stories, it uses them in a new way to bring out an entirely new point of view. In any case, today I'm going to be talking about one of the famous allegories in the three traditions, and that's the story of the creation of man. They say one example is better than 30 ex 30 so-so examples. I hope this will be a pretty good example. I never gave this lecture before. And in order to set a little background, I just going to mention a couple things about the way the stories develop, or the story develops in the uh, Jewish tradition and the Christian tradition. Now, Houston Smith, professor of Harvard, said in his very nice book, The Religions of Man that of all the people of antiquity, the Jewish people, the ancient Jews, have to be distinguished in their persistent, passionate, continuous search for meaning, religious meaning in their lives. They were constantly, consistently trying to understand how the hand of God was working in their trials and tribulations, their victories, their defeats, and their joys and their sorrows. Page after page after page of the Old Testament, if you've ever read through it, the Jewish scripture, is exactly that, a working out, a tr an attempt to try to come to understand how God was working through, through and in the Jewish community. Such questions and such a search for religious meaning in your life naturally goes back to 
questions about the origins of the human personality. And so, after the Bible talks about the creation of the cosmos, it then talks about the creation of Adam. And the, the perception given, or, the, or the, uh, the minimum we could say that we could get from this story, and by the way, I don't want to minimize it because it's open to many and vastly different interpretations. But the basic perception we get is that somehow in man becoming man, as we know ourselves today, in that story, he essentially fell from a state of purity to a state of impurity, from a state of goodness to a state of sinfulness, from a state of, in some sense, perfection, human perfection maybe, to a state of corruption, from essentially a higher state to a lower state. And that's why it's often referred to as the fall of man. Christianity, of course, took over the same story. It has its the Bible, the Old Testament, is part of its scriptures. Christianity took over the same story and developed it, the idea even further, and from its own special perspective. In Christianity, it saw that it, somehow the story of the fall of man tells us that somehow, in man becoming man as we now know ourselves, our nature became so utterly corrupted so utterly sinful that almost ne anything a human being does is tainted with sin. Even to go to an extreme, man's worship is often commingled with corruption and sin. And it's not so hard to believe because the idea was that even in a person's worship, that's so tied up into his ego and his sense of self-righteousness and his own sense of his own goodness that, and many other things as well, that it's easy to see that there's a thin line between serving God and serving yourself. And the Christians felt, Christian thought felt that even a man's worship was somehow contaminated. And so, from the Christian point of view, God entered the human sphere, human history, in a unique and miraculous way. The word of God, or the wisdom of God, to use ancient terminology, early term church terminology, the wisdom of God, or the Word of God, was revealed not in a scripture, but in a person, in the flesh, in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, and that through his living and dying and resurrection, mankind would be ultimately saved. And a very deep and profound philosophy and theology developed around that. And it's sort of from that background, more or less, that many Western scholars of Islam come to study the Quran and Muslim sources. And what background we come from oftentimes very much affects how we read another people's scripture another pe or understand another person's religion. We sort of relate their terms to our categories, sort of siphon them through our own understanding and come to certain conclusions. In any case, let me begin by talking a little bit about uh, the Quran and the story of Adam. Now, the Quran, as most of you know, begins with, because I can see the majority in this audience are Muslim, begins, has 114 surahs, or chapters, is usually roughly translated into English. The first one is somewhat different than all the rest. The first one is seven short verses. And it's unique in that it begins by just presenting a prayer that the reader of the Quran reads. And, and of course, as he does it, he's making the same prayer. And in this prayer, he asks for guidance. He asks, he asks for God's help and guidance in life, to keep him to the right way, to give him the strength and not to let him go away from the right way, the straight path, so to speak. And essentially, the first seven verses are exactly that, a prayer for guidance. The rest of the Quran, the, the, the perspective shifts somewhat. From that point on, from the second surah on, it is, it is basically God proclaiming to mankind. It's not a, it's a history of a people. It's not a story of a people. It's not a biography of a people. It is essentially God proclaiming to mankind. In throughout, here and there, there are stories of people and examples and parables. But from start to finish, the second surah to the end, it's basically God proclaiming a revelation to mankind. And the second surah begins by telling the reader that this Quran is an answer to his prayer 
that he just recited in the first surah. It begins in the three Arabic letters, Aleph, Lam, Mim, and then it says, this is the book, or this is the scripture, wherein no doubt is guidance to mankind. So the reader quickly realizes that as he approaches this book, he is coming, he's, this is an answer to his prayer, more or less. And then the next 29 uh, verses or so, 28 verses or so, describe the audience. And what are the prerequisites to get guidance from this book? Much like a modern author would write a book. You write a book, you describe your audience, you describe what they need, what pre prerequisites do they need to gain from, from what is written. About 30, when you reach the 30th verse, you come to the story of Adam. And it begins like this. It begins, verse 30 of the, of the second surah, it begins, Behold, your Lord said to the angels, I will create a vicegerent on earth, or a representative on earth. And they said, Will you place therein one who will make mischief, who will spread corruption and shed blood? While we celebrate your praises and glorify your holy name? And he said, God said, I know what you do not know. So many a Western writer, especially in the early part of the century, would say the angels ask a very crucial question. And then they said, God, in his answer, at least according to the Quran, basically dismisses it. I know what you do not know. But as we'll see as we read on, that's not the case at all. The Quran does continue to start to answer that very difficult question. And it is a very difficult question. If we look at that verse again, it says, Behold, your Lord said to the angels, I will create a representative on earth. Now notice at this stage that Adam hasn't appeared on the scene yet. He has not even been created. But the, revelation, the Quran says, Behold, God said to the angels, I will create a representative on earth. Some conclusions we could immediately draw from that. At least from the standpoint of the Quran, man is not being, when God, even before God creates man, he intends to put him on the earth. In other words, this earthly journey of mankind is not considered a punishment. Somehow it fits into God's overall plan. And the Quran will constantly do this as we read through it, although we won't read through it all today. But it will constantly t approach you with a verse that just suddenly strikes you right where you stand, shocks you, and forces you to think deeply about what it has to say. The first time I picked up the Quran, by the way, I was an atheist. I've been an atheist all my adult life, most of my life, period. And I love to study religions, and I love to study ultimate questions about man and what religions had to hold out for the meaning of his life. And when I came upon this verse, I was exactly that, shocked. Because it, it uh, approaches you with a very difficult question. Some would say the atheist question. And what is the atheist question? exactly what the angels ask. Will you create one who will go, who do mischief therein, spread corruption and shed blood? The question is, why are you creating this creature to put on earth? It shows that God creates man for the intention of putting him, part of his intention, part of his overall plan, is to put man on earth. And the atheist asked the difficult question, why are you going to create this creature who's going to spread corruption and shed much blood, who's going to suffer such agony and destroy each other, and there's going to be pain and agony and suffering. Two, two objections are contained, if you allow the word, contained in the question. Number one, why are you going to create a creature that, number one, is going to suffer so much, apparently, on earth? And two, why are you going to create a cre make a creation that could do such a thing in the first place? that could be rebel against your will, that could be out of harmony with your will, that could do such disasters in the first place. The atheist would say, why didn't you? His objection to the idea of God is, if there is a God and he's all merciful and all loving and all giving and all kind, then why doesn't he pop me into heaven in the first place and save me the suffering here on earth? Why didn't he make me an angel so that I would never have to go through this torment? And notice, it's extremely important who the question is coming from. It is coming from the angels. 
What do we think of when we think of angels? Every culture has almost very similar points of view. When we think of an angel, we think of the very best that human beings could be. I mean, when you hear, when you read uh, newspaper writings that talk about Mother Teresa, how is she described? She's described as an angel of mercy, an angel of hope. When somebody does a very kind deed for us, we say, oh, that person is such an angel. When my little children, three daughters, sleep at night, and I look at them, two hours ago they were tearing up the house, but now they're sleeping silently and beautifully in complete harmony with nature. I look at my wife and say, well, aren't they just such beautiful little angels? Even in the New Testament, not even in the New Testament, and I'm not uh, going to comment on or try to develop Christian or Jewish uh, perspectives here, but even in the New Testament, along the same lines, it, wa it talks about how Jesus and his becoming man or in his humanity was made a little lower than the angels. The gospel to, in the letter to the Hebrews. Somehow we've all come to realize that somehow the human state is something lower than the angelic state. And so when the angels ask this question, it has much more force than if you or I ask the question. If, if hypothetically God informed us that he was going to create a creature that had the potential to shed blood and spread corruption and do all sorts of damage and disaster, well, we could certainly question the move. But on the other hand, we know he created us already and we do that. So our objection or our question would not have as much force. But it's much more powerful when the per what we consider to be perfect beings, the perfection of humanity or higher than humanity, when they ask the question, has a lot more force. The question just simply says, why are you creating these? when you could create beings like us. As the next line clearly says, it says, while we, while we, the angels, celebrate your praises and glorify your holy name. Why are you creating this? When we celebrate your praises and glorify your holy name. And the response of the Quran is, God says, I know, but you do not. But the Quran doesn't dismiss the matter there. In the next verse, the story continues. And God, and he taught Adam the names of all things. Notice that this will differ just slightly from the biblical account in places, largely in other places. Sometimes just the sequence of event changes. But it brings out a different meaning. And then God taught Adam the names of all things. And then he placed them before the angels and said, tell me their names if what you say is true, if you are right. Notice in this verse, we could, we could immediately notice a few things. Number one, it says, And God taught Adam the names of all things. And so we find that Adam is a learning creature. He has the ability to be taught. And this is going to be, throughout the Quran, this is going to get tremendous emphasis, the gift that man has of intelligence. And what is he taught? Well, not simply language, not like a parrot. He's taught the names of all things. He's given the ability to name things, to give verbal symbols for his concept, his ideas, his thoughts. Man is able to conceptually, he's able to verbalize all that he thinks, give verbal symbols to it, and communicate these ideas, these perceptions to others. This is one of the great intellectual tools we have, not just our ability to speak, but our ability to communicate what we feel and what we think and what we realize. And then he placed the things before, and placed them, these things, before the angels and said, tell me their names if you are right. So the verse right here shows that God is addressing the question of the angels. And they said, glory to you. We have no knowledge except what you taught us. In truth, it is you who are perfect in knowledge and wisdom. So the angels admit this is beyond their ability. Not only do they admit that this is beyond their ability, that they don't have the intellectual tools to name things, as man, or as, as we'll see in a second, as man can. They also admit that this takes certain qualities. They say, we cannot do it. We are limited. We only know what you taught us. And you, of course, can. You are perfect in knowledge and wisdom. So the, not implicitly we understand to do such a thing 
It takes a certain amount of wisdom. It takes a certain amount of knowledge. It takes a certain intellectual gift. God, of course, is perfect. He's a perfect source of wisdom and knowledge. The angels, obviously here, admit their inferiority. They can't do it. The man, we find in the next verse, comes in between. And we said, O oh, Adam, There it is, eight. And then God said, he said actually, O oh Adam, tell them their names. And when he had told them their names, God said, now just in case we don't, we make a mistake that this question, this answer is not going back to the original question. And God said, did I not tell you that I know the secrets of the heaven and earth and I know what you reveal and what you conceal? In other words, is this not a partial answer to your question? So here we see the angel's question receiving a partial answer. And throughout the Quran, the Quran is going to force us to dwell on the question and the answers, possible answers as, as they develop as we go through it. And for the person approaching the Quran for the first time, who hasn't grown up with it, and who these questions are extremely significant and important to, he's going to be haunted by these questions as he proceeds through the Quran. <clears throat> so not only in that verse, verse 33, does God inform the angels that he has partly answered his question, but he also in the 34th verse, we have, we're, know, we're made to know that this ability of man gives him the potential to be superior, superior to the angels, to angelic hosts. A partial answer to their question, obviously. For it says, and behold, we said to the angels, bow down to Adam, and they bowed down. Once seeing this evident superiority in man, at least in his intellectual ability, they're asked to bow down to Adam. This makes him potentially superior, and they bowed down. Not so Iblis. He refused and was proud, and he was of those, he was of the rejectors, the rejectors of God, the rejectors of faith, the rejectors of guidance. Who is Iblis? Later in the Quran, we found out he's a creature of fire, one of the jinn use the Arabic term, the creature of fire. And, and that's an appropriate term, because much like his fiery self, he has a very fiery nature, a destructive, consuming pride, a destructive, consuming envy. And he is a creature dominated by his pride and his envy. Later on, in the seventh surah, which actually develops ideas in this, even though it was revealed much earlier than this surah, in this account, it actually comments on some of the things I'm talking about now. And in that seventh surah, we see that Iblis, Satan, comes at Adam through the same door, gets him to slip through the same way, the door of pride and envy. He comes to him and he says, I, if you just disobey this little command, this little thing, you could become like an angel, or you could obtain great knowledge. Notice both of these things are admirable from the standpoint of the Qur'an. Knowledge is an admirable thing. The Qur'an mentions knowledge 854 times the word and its derivatives appear. Knowledge from the standpoint of the Qur'an is a very valued gift of God. Purity, like the purity of the angels, is a very valued gift of God. But Satan comes to Adam, we find out in the seventh surah, and says, just disobey this little command. You'll have great knowledge, and you'll also have, you'll be like the angels. Both really desirable qualities, but not if it comes at the expense of rebellion against the will of God, and not especially if it's born out of pride and envy and arrogance. And so, for the Muslim, where, where you often hear the expression in the West, because now you're always living, most of you are living here and you've heard this, that the root of all evil is money that money is the root of all evil. The Muslim would say, based on his understanding of the Quran, he would say that all evil essentially goes back to the sin of pride and arrogance and envy. That envy, arrogance, and pride are perhaps the root of all evil. And we said, it says in the 35th verse, O Adam, dwell you and your spouse in the garden, and eat freely thereof what you wish. But come not near this tree, for you will be among the wrongdoers. Now, Muslim commentators like Al-Tabri and Ibn Kathir and others, relying on essentially what are known as traditions that sort of came through Jewish and Christian converts to Islam 
and information that they brought with them, tried to identify exactly what this tree was. And God knows best what it was. But the way the Quran puts it, it seems like more or less just an arbitrary command. God gives Adam a moral choice. Come not near this tree. Everything else is fine. Just stay, avoid this tree. He gives man a choice. But Satan caused them to slip and expelled them from the state in which they were. Satan caused Adam and his spouse, we later learn, to slip and expelled them from the state in which they were. And we said, get all of you down. Most Muslim experts on the Quran, scholars, assume that this is a reference to all of humanity and all uh, uh, satanic uh, influences. And we said, get you all down. With enmity between you, on earth will be your dwelling place and provision for a time. All of you, get down now. But, as, but this seems to create a problem, because we learned in the first verse that man was intended for a life on earth from the start. So is this verse a punishment, or is it the realization of part of God's plan? The Muslim would say it's a realization of part of God's plan, and not essentially a punishment. That God intended to have man serve an earthly life from the start. This was part of it. If we look to the Quran, God is preparing man. He's teaching him. He's developing his intellectual skills. Man is a learning creature. If we hear the angel's question carefully, back in verse 30, we find that man is a choosing creature. He has a certain free will. He could rebel against the will of God like no other creature in existence. So God gives man two things and prepares him and develops him. He develops his intellect, his intelligence. He gives him a certain intellectual potential, potential and nurtures him along in that direction. And he also gives man choice. And then finally presents man with the moral choice. And he makes the error, the error that he ultimately had to make. For we knew it in the first verse that he would ultimately make errors. And when he commits that first error, that signals the beginning of his earthly life. So we see man proceeding along as God planned, uh, had in his divine plan. The next verse shows that the earthly life certainly is not a punishment. Because in the next verse, tone of the Quran is not punishing at all. It's very sympathetic. It's very conciliatory. It's God reaching out to Adam, consoling him, assuring him, promising him. It says, then Adam received from his Lord certain words. And Muslim scholars understand as consolation, promises, promises of guidance, as the next sequence, the next verse shows. And his Lord turned towards him in mercy, for he is oft returning, ever merciful. So this is not a punishing tone. He's coming at Adam with mercy and forgiveness. He knows that Adam has, this is his nature. He knows that mankind will err. Later we'll see that error is one of the main elements of the human process in life. This, one of the, uh, well, I'll get to that in a minute. The next verse says, we said, go down, all of you. It repeats it again. But notice this time, just so we understand it's not a punishment, it repeats the same expression but this time in a very gentle, very merciful, very kind way. He said, we said, go down, all of you, from here, but truly there will come to you guidance from me. And now it reassures, and whoever follows my guidance, God's reaching out towards Adam, he's consoling him, on them will be no fear, nor shall they grieve. It's not really punishing at all. But so the reader understands that this life has purpose, and so that the reader understands that it has definite consequences which will be realized in the next life, not to be taken light, lightly, there has to come a warning. And so the next verse says, but for those who are the rejectors, the rejectors of guidance, the rejectors of God, the rejectors of conscience, the rejectors of, of uh, the moral imperative, for those who are the rejectors and give the lie to our signs, they are the people of the fire. They shall abide therein. And we'll get back more to that in just a minute. So in any case, just to summarize very quickly what I said so far, we find that man was created for the purpose of an earthly life. 
He goes through a period of preparation. We know he's a creature of choice. We know he's even an erring creature. This is very nature, as the angels point out in their question. He eventually makes the error, signals the beginning of his earthly life. Adam sins and is immediately forgiven. So this life is not simply a punishment. When the many Western writers saw that Adam sinned and was immediately forgiven, many of them wrote, the Quran seems to be missing the point. The point is that this life, this drudgery and pain, is because he sinned. And the Quran just forgives him. But that's their own religious bias. Even if they were atheists, they come from a particular religious environment, a particular perception. But that's not the point of the Quran. The point is this life is not a punishment. It serves a much more important purpose. Three elements are emphasized in this story. If you'll let me write them on the board. Three essential components of the human drama. One is that man is a creature of intellect. Second, he's a creature of choice. The Muslims would say he has a free will, but not an independent will. He has a free will that comes from God. God allows him to make choices. He allows him to carry out his choices. He allows them to him to, he allows those, his actions to realize their intention, what he intended them to do. Made this universe according to certain uh, laws, follow certain patterns, and so he allows man to choose, carry out his choice, lets that choice lead to its inevitable consequence. But all of that comes from God. God maintains and, and his pervasive influence sees over all of that. So man, according to the Muslim point of view, is given free choice, but of course all things are dependent on God, even that much. So free choice, but not independent choice. And third thing this story uh, stresses is that man in his life will face adversity. He's going to face suffering. He's going to face agony. There will be pain. There will be corruption. There will definitely be hardship said in the very angel's very first question, what I call, like to call the atheist question, why are you going to create a creature that's going to cause and suffer this pain, suffering, adversity? So we saw in the, in the beginnings of the verses, we saw the stress on man's intellectual abilities. And of course, he was presented the ultimate choice. Let me just say a little bit more about each of these, because they get repeated so often throughout the Quran. These are brought up to mind that you can't miss them. They force you to reflect on them. What about intellect? Well, when Western scholars studied Islam at the end of last century and throughout most of this century, every single one remarked on one thing, even though they had many different points of view, that the Quran puts tremendous stress on reason, the role that reason plays in faith. Western authors, coming from their own background, actually thought this was too much stress on reason. They said the Quran puts too much stress on reason. But actually, I think that judgment was a cultural bias. In the West, we've long had this feeling that there's this tremendous gulf, this chasm between faith and reason. We felt that the two were virtually incompatible. Many, many people will tell you today, well, it's just faith. You know, well, yeah, but I mean, why do you believe this? Or why does this happen? Or why, well, you just have to take it on faith. So in the West, we've come to accept, more or less, that there is no, no mingling, no compatibility, or very little compatibility between faith and reason. But if you talk to people of other cultures, other religious perspectives, not just Muslim, but Hindu, Buddhist, Taoist, etc., you'll see in those cultures, although they realize there's difficulties in, in using reason, and that say, foolish people or people that are weak-minded are easily led astray by their thinking. They don't see this tremendous gulf, this tremendous dichotomy between faith and reason. And so, but nonetheless, the Western scholars, if they prove nothing else in that remark, they prove that the Quran puts tremendous stress on reason. Henri Lemens, the famous French scholar, in the beginning of the century wrote, that the Quran puts so much stress on reason in attaining to faith that you would think that disbelief is an infirmity of the human mind. That disbelief is the inability to think straight. That was his comment. Maxime Rodinson 
who wrote the famous book, Islam and Capitalism, a Marxist economist scholar of Islam, the French also. He wrote that the Quran continually stresses reason again and again and again. He said 13 times it says to the disbelievers, to those who reject the Quran and God and the message of the Quran, he said 13 times it addresses them and says, have you then no sense? Can't you think straight? Time and time again, the Quran insists that this is a revelation for people that are wise, for people who think, for people who use the reason. It says, will they not consider the cosmos above them? Will they not consider the ground below them? Will they not consider how plants are made? Will they not consider this sign of God, this manifestation of God, this, this manifestation of harmony and perfection in the universe? Will they not look to the stars? Will they not look to themselves? And then again and again it says, will they not use their reason? Will they not think? Will they not reflect? As I said before, the word knowledge, the Arabic word for knowledge and its derivatives, is one of the most frequently occurring words in the Quran. Few occur more often. 854 times it occurs. Even the very first revelation from the very start, the first proclamation which, with which uh, Muhammad, peace be upon him, was inspired, put tremendous stress right from the start on reason. It began with an Arabic word, ekra. It means read. It's an Arabic command, literally. Read in the name of your Lord who created. Created man out of a tiny creature that clings. Read, it commands you again. Read, and your Lord is most bountiful. What great bounty did he give us? Why should we read? What great bounty is he referring to? For he taught man the use of the pen. Taught man that which he knew not. Through reading and writing, man could learn things he would never be able to know. He could reach worlds and peoples and perceptions that are far, far outside of his domain. And through this method, we, we learn as a group. Our knowledge is cumulative. It grows through the process of reading and writing, through this great gift. And the Quran then goes on to tell you that most people, most people are ungrateful when it comes to this gift, or, any gift, or the other gifts of God as well, but in particular this gift. They think they're set, they see themselves as self-sufficient with all the great gifts that God has given us, but in particular the gift of knowledge and reading and writing. Choice, you don't have to say too much about that. Apparently, we are creatures of choice. Unfortunately, I just have to make a couple of statements about it. Uh, one is because there's one verse that's often mistranslated in the Quran, and it leads to a lot of confusion when people in the West read it. So I'll address that in just a second. But like I said, the Quran stresses that the human being is a choosing creature. He has a certain free will. And one verse, a very nice verse, it says that God could have made mankind into a single religious community. But he chose to let us differ. Could have made us all believers. But that's not the point. That's not the purpose behind life. So he allows us to differ. And to differ into different communities. And these people be atheists, and these people believers, and these people be different types of believers. In another verse it says, we have revealed to you the book with the truth for mankind. He who lets himself be guided does so to his own good. If you wish to be guided, if you choose to be guided, you do so to your own gain. He who goes astray does so to his own hurt. If you want to ignore the guidance, it's your choice. You're hurting yourself, is the standpoint of the Quran. I'm not trying to preach to you, by the way. I'm just trying to present the subject from the standpoint of the Quran. <coughs> the verse I talked about that's often mistranslated and leads to confusion there's a verse that's often translated into English as, God guides whom he chooses and leads into error, or leads astray whom he chooses. And so many people will say, see, I mean, the Quran talked about free choice, and now it's saying that all, you know, God forces people to go astray, makes them err. That's hardly, that's too much determinism, goes against the grain. But one very brilliant scholar, and a linguist as well, at the beginning of this century, Western scholar by the name of Ignaz Goldzahir, in, a, in one of his great books about Islam, wrote that this is one of the most falsely translated or mis un misunderstood uh, verses in the entire Quran. And he went back to ancient Arabic lexicons and studied the verb, 
that people were translating as God guides whom he wills and leads astray whom he wills. And he said that verb, the Arabic verb, has two principal meanings, both equally acceptable, and one perhaps even the second perhaps more natural than the first. And when they say God guides whom he chooses and leads astray whom he chooses, he said the verb they translated as lead astray could actually and equally and more appropriately be translated as allows to stray. It's a subtle difference. But he gave the example of like when you untie a camel and let it stray. The verb actually means to allow to wander or to wander. It could have either meaning. Allow to err or, or just simply not to guide. So he insisted and he proved his point by taking the verses out of the Quran where it appears and looking at the verses above and below it to see them in their context. He proved his point, and by the way, the editor that, that, that uh, edited his book in English said that he used to hold the other point of view, but now he became uh, convinced that the correct interpretation of this verse is God guides whom he wills, and he allows to stray whom he wills. He doesn't impose guidance on anybody. As Fazlur Rahman from the University of Chicago pointed out about 30 or 40 years after that, he pointed out that, again, if you look at the context, not only does that the correct interpretation, but the Quran also shows that that guidance or that allowing us to err comes according to our predisposition, predis our choices, our sincerity. For example, the Quran says that if you're sincere, God will guide you. If you seek him, God will guide, guide you. For those who seek him, he will guide them. But for those who reject guidance, he'll leave them astray. For those whose hearts are hardened against guidance, he allows them to wander. He doesn't force it upon them. In one nice verse, it says, for those who allowed their hearts to swerve, he let their hearts swerve further, more. But again, it's the point that if we choose, the choices that we make determine the result. So, for example, in one of the very beautiful sayings of the prophet, peace be upon him. He says that, the God said that if a servant comes to him by a hand's breath, he comes to him by an arm's length. If a servant comes to God walking, he comes to him running. He responds to our choices. Suffering gets tremendous emphasis throughout the Quran. When I was an atheist and I first read the Quran, this was the most disturbing, these this was the most disturbing subject for me. Just when I was reading for it, just when I was starting to relax, just when I was starting to love the language and the beauty and the melody and its rhythms, a verse like would touch on this subject and just gnaw at me. And here's just a few of them. God puts tremendous emphasis on the role of human suffering. Do you think you could enter paradise without having suffered like those who passed away before you? When I read that, I read it about several times. I just stood there and read it. What is it possibly trying to say? Do you think you could enter paradise without having the next life, paradisal state, without having suffered like those who came before you? And I thought, what is paradise? Is it simply a place or is it a state? What is it trying to say? And then another verse in the third surah, it says, you will certainly be tried in your possessions and yourselves. Make no mistake about it. You will certainly be tried in your possessions and yourselves. Good or bad, you will suffer. In another verse, it says in the second surah, the 155th verse, most surely we will try you with something of danger and hunger and the loss of worldly goods and of your lives and of the fruits of your labor. You will definitely experience these threats and these pains of the loss of your goods and danger and hunger hunger and the loss of lives and the fruits of your labor. And it just doesn't say this to bad people, because in the next verse it says, the next line it says, but give glad tidings to those who are patient in adversity, who, when calamity befalls them, say, truly unto God do we belong, and truly do, unto him do we return. So it shows that this suffering is not just meted out to sinners, but to good and bad alike. We will experience suffering. It has a major role to play in this. In one verse, the Quran reaches out to us very sympathetically. I forget, the 84th surah, I think it says, O mankind, truly you are toiling towards your Lord in painful toil, but you shall meet him. It's assuring us 
We're struggling. Yes, you're struggling. You're suffering. But don't lose sight of the fact you shall meet me, that God is telling the reader. All right, you say. Intellect, choice, adversity, suffering. God put us here for a purpose. What purpose is it? Maybe I'm just reading something into the Quran that's not there, I thought. Maybe, maybe I'm just assuming that I'm, there's a purpose. Maybe I'm reading more than it is. Maybe it doesn't really even address the question. But it does. Just when I was ready, or just when you're ready to say, well, it can't be any purpose. I'm just, I'm looking into this more than I should. I'm giving this more credit than I should. A verse like this will strike you. In the third surah, we did not create the heavens and earth and all that is between them in vain. We didn't create all this with no purpose. Just when you're ready to relax on the point. And then in the 21st surah it says, We have not created the heaven and the earth and what is ever between them in sport, as an entertainment. If we wished to take a sport, we could have done it by ourselves, if we were to do that at all. The point is, is that God doesn't need to entertain himself, as the last line clearly shows, and he didn't create this as an entertainment or a sport as a definite purpose. In the 23rd surah, it says, do you think we created you purposely and that you will not be returned to us? The true sovereign Lord is too exalted above that. He doesn't do silly things. He doesn't do strange things like that. Well, everything he does has a purpose. It may not be clearly visible to us, but it has a purpose. So what purpose is there? So the reader is forced to seek a purpose. What is the purpose in life? Well, the first place to begin that answer is to be, what does the Quran ask him to do? That's a natural place, I think the logical place, to begin to answer the question. And several times you'll see a phrase like this appear in the Quran. One very beautiful surah in partic particular. It says, in time, all mankind is lost. And this surah is extremely important. Many say, sayings of the Prophet, peace be upon him, point about the importance, the significance of this surah, because it summarizes the key to understanding our duty in life, our, what, what we should do with our lives. In time, all men are in a state of loss, except, except for who? Except for those, and the Arabic word they usually translate as believe, it's aminu, which means more than that. It's more than simply believe. The root is, comes, comes from the root meaning to find security in, to find trust in except for those who find security and trust in God, belief in God, faith in God, security and trust in God, and who do what? Who do right, who do good, and who teach truth, and who teach fortitude, patience in adversity. Okay? So that says, in time, all mankind is lost, except for those who, who, except for those who find faith and trust in God and do good. And then how does one go about doing good? And you'll see this phrase appeared many times, many, many times in the Quran. Yeah, all these people are lost, except for these. Who? Those who find faith and trust in God and do good. These people are going to end up like this, except for those who find faith and trust in God and do good. It's a repeated theme throughout the Quran. How does one do good? Well, the Quran says you give to the poor. You take care of the orphan. You take care of the widow. You forgive others, even though you may have a right to, re to revenge. Sometimes you have to fight, of course. The Quran tells us we should fight the tyr against tyranny. We should fight against oppression. We should stand up for justice. We should show kindness to the weak. Okay? We should forgive. We should be merciful. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is for the Muslim the exemplar. And the Quran says that much. It says he is the best of examples. And what does it tell us about him? that he is a mercy unto mankind. So the Muslim understands that he should try to be merciful as well. He should show compassion. He should grow in justice. He should be giving. The Muslim believes he should be truthful, kind. He should teach others, as that verse I just quoted say, said. He should love his fellow man. This is being good. And as the Quran points out in a number of places, this is the very essence of faith and of religion, together with finding faith and trust and security in God. And no, notice also in the verse that I just quoted, I began by quoting, it says that we should not only do these things, we should teach them. And so by teaching them, we learn them. And so 
the process is great. We're not just there to do good, but we're to grow in goodness. And we're to teach goodness. And we're to learn goodness. And to learn and teach faith and trust in God. So why? Uh, another verse along those lines, one of my favorite is, Truly those who find faith and trust in God and do good will the most merciful endow with love. And to, the, and to this end have we made this easy to understand in your own tongue so that you may give glad tidings to those who are God-conscious and warn those given to contention, to fighting, to bickering. Most, the most merciful will certainly endow with love. And to this end, we have made this easy to understand in your own tongue. So the Muslim understands that he must grow and, lo and learn love of his fellow man. So what would that achieve? Well, for one thing, the Quran promises that we, and Islam promises as well, the many sayings of the Prophet, that we will get peace and joy and serenity in this life and infinitely greater in the next. And that's really not that surprising. Because we all do know that it's better to forgive than to avenge, to give than to take. We all do know that it's better to reach out to others than just satisfy our own physical needs. We all do know that it's better to love than to be indifferent. These are things that all people all over the globe admire and cherish and, pr and praise. Right? And they do give us real peace and joy in this life. Those are the things worth living. Those are the things that we're going to look back 20 years from now, and th those moments are the moments we're going to cherish. It's not going to be the four pairs of shoes, or the size of your house, or the car you drive, that you drove back in 1993. 20 years from now, you'll remember those intangible moments when you shared an act of great kindness with someone, you showed an act, you loved someone like your children, for example, so tenderly, those are the moments that will stay with you and you'll cherish the rest of your life, not the physical gains. But is that it? I mean, is that the purpose in life? Just to grow in goodness, just sort of a type of humanism, to become better human beings, to become wiser human beings, to become, uh, have a better nature, to grow in virtue and love of our fellow man and kindness, is that it? No, right? If we thought that was it, we'd be ignoring some of the essential points of the Quran. Because while the Quran does stress that we should grow in goodness, that we should grow in mercy towards others, that we should teach these things, that we should learn these things. You see, for example, Luqman, the prophet Luqman, peace be upon him, teaching his children, his son, this lesson very tenderly. While we should grow in these things and teach them, you know, we always should not forget the very way these phrases begin. Those phrases that stress that a person should do good. And they begin by saying we should grow in all men are in a state of loss except for those who what? Except for those who find faith and trust in God. That's where it begins. And grow in goodness and teach these things to others and learn them themselves. So the question ultimately goes back to God. So very quickly you start wondering how is God portrayed in the Quran. And if you look through the Quran very carefully, you come upon some beautiful verses that describe God. God. One in particular, which says, call upon God, or call upon the All-Merciful. Whatever you call upon, to Him belongs the most beautiful names. To Him belongs the attributes of perfection, the most beautiful names. When I came upon that verse, I naturally read what are some of the beautiful names. And you find he is the most merciful, the most compassionate, the loving, the kind, the clement, the giving, the bountiful, the generous. He is the just. He is the truth. He is the truthful. As you go throughout the Quran, page by page, almost any page you come on, you'll see several of these attributes punctuating certain statements. Several of these on almost any page. Sometimes you'll see many, many on, on a page. But after a long line, he'll say, and God does this, why? Because he's the merciful, the compassionate. Because he's the wise and the kind. Because he's the clement. Because he's the forgiving. Because he's the one who turns towards others. Because he is the just. Because he is the truthful. He does these things. Does, he acts the way he does because of this, these beautiful names that he possesses. Now, it doesn't take a genius, as you read through the Quran, that the very attributes that God wants us to grow in, that he wants us to learn, mercy, compassion, forgiveness, etc. 
have their origin, their perfection, their ultimate beauty in God. We are to grow in compassion. God is the compassionate. We are to grow in mercy. God is the merciful. We are to grow in forgiveness. God is the forgiving. We are to grow in justice. God is the just. So by growing in these, we not only find certain peace and serenity within ourselves and wonderful moments that make our life worth living, but as we grow in these, we grow, to use a Quranic term, nearer and nearer to God. Not from distance, but in some very special way. So the Muslim believes as he grows in these, he grows in his ability to receive and experience the infinite love, the infinite mercy, the infinite compassion, the infinite perfection, the infinite goodness that is God, that is, comes from God, that has its perfection and its origin in God. Here's an analogy I use once in a while, and it somehow gets the point. I mean, what do you need to learn these to experience God's mercy, love, compassion? Well, one reason is, take just a simple analogy. Let's say I have a fish, a cat, and three daughters. Actually, I only have the latter three. I don't have the first two. But let's just pretend I have a fish, a cat, and three daughters. A fish I could shower my love on. I could change its water. I could keep a heater by its bowl. I could feed it daily. And it could certainly experience my love and my mercy on some level. Certainly my cat being more intelligent and knowing something of being at a higher level of intelligence and probably emotion, if we allow for the word, could certainly experience my love and my compassion and my giving on a much higher level. And so too my daughters, one of them is now seven years old, as she grows and learns and experiences love and compassion and mercy and truth and forgiveness herself, she too now can experience my love, my mercy, my compassion on a much higher level, much higher than a cat, certainly. And now that I'm full grown and I have children of my own and I am learning through that process of being a father, love, compassion, and mercy on a much higher level than anything else. Because when you give to children, it's not out of any want in return. It is just pure love. Or it's very close to it anyway. And now that I am experiencing this, I'm experiencing this. The relationship with my parents has grown to a much higher degree. As the Quran says, somehow when somebody becomes 40 years old, it's a key moment in his life. I'm almost there. Because that, and it points to the relationship of a child to his parents as he becomes 40 in age. Because as you bring up your own children, you come to appreciate, you come to experience, you come to recall your own parents' love, compassion, and mercy like you never did before, and suddenly all that you're doing becomes, you've projected back and understand what they did to you. And that relationship with them becomes that much more powerful and intimate and close. So you're so, suddenly you're able to share in things that you really couldn't when you were a child. <clears throat> and so it is, as the Muslim sees, with God. As you grow in love and mercy and compassion and forgiveness and in goodness, you could better receive and experience the infinite mercy the infinite goodness that is God, that is God's. The prophet, peace be upon him, used to say that the human heart, not the physical organ, but the receptive organ, the organ that we're, which we feel, you know, what would I say, good feelings, kindness, mercy, etc. The human heart is like any other mechanism. If you work it and use it and work on it and stick to your prayers, and could be, remain conscious of God, and continue doing good deeds, and more good deeds, and trying to perfect yourself, it becomes polished. It becomes more receptive to God's love, mercy, and compassion. And if you do, to, to God's beauty. And if you don't, it becomes rusty. It becomes rusty and black, and it falls into disuse, and becomes inoperative. <clears throat> and this point about the way Muslims perceive life growing in these uh, attributes is often missed by people when they write about the Muslim rituals, especially from the outside. Many writers point out that, and they're very sympathetic, and we appreciate it, they point out that when a Muslim prays and he goes through this exercise, it's very good for his legs, for example. It stretches his muscle, muscles, makes him very uh, nimble. They could sit on the ground for hours without complaining. They point out that it's a great community exercise. It creates community discipline and cohesion. It's a great spiritual discipline. Many writers will write about Islam from the outside, and especially nowadays with a great deal of objectivity and sympathy. 
but they miss, many Muslims complain that they miss the entire point of the rituals, especially the prayer. Because for the Muslim, the prayer is so much more than that. Because as he grows, or tries to grow, and hopefully does, in goodness, and as he sticks to the prayers day in, day out, five times a day for the rest of his life, focusing for those five moments at five different times a day on God and his relationship to him, every Muslim that I've talked to sort of uh, reports the same general trend, depending on how far, far along they got. To tell you, as they first began this at some age in their life, the prayers were very much a discipline. And they created a great deal of strength of will in them. But as they continued to strive to do good and continued to pray day in, day out, not missing, they'll say that suddenly they noticed that the prayers became more a peaceful exercise. And they began, began to feel this tremendous peace and serenity. And they would go rushing to the prayer to feel this peace and serenity in a hectic life. But then you'll notice many a Muslim will tell you as they continued and worked on themselves and tried to be conscious of their spiritual and moral progress and as they continued to pray day in, day out, not leaving the prayers, they'll tell you that the prayers became so much more than that. That suddenly, slowly but surely, they became more and more cognizant of the prayers that they were in, in the presence of this tremendous mercy and compassion and love and forgiveness and power. And that the more they progressed and the more they stayed with it, the more acutely aware they became of it. So that in fact, for many a Muslim, the prayer has become just this tremendous divine embrace where he feels that he is in this tremendous presence of this all-merciful, powerful, loving God. And it's that love that he feels, that mercy, that forgiveness that he, share, that he is given the, the power, the faculty to share, that mercy, love, compassion becomes the guiding principle in his life, his strongest motivation. He longs and yearns for the day when he could be in the presence of that mercy and compassion where all the material things are stripped away and he could bask in it without any earthly deflection. That is, becomes, for many a Muslim, their ultimate yearning and their very motive for living and life. And so every other love, every other relationship in their life translates to that one. Even as they love their children, in loving their children, they see themselves, in essence, it's just another way of loving God. Not that they don't love their children sincerely. They love them all the more beautifully. But in that relationship, they somehow see the love of God. Well, in any case, we come back to the angel's question. Because the natural question, it's easy to get swept away in all this, but the natural question is, well, why didn't God just program us with these feelings in the first place? I mean, why didn't he just pop us into heaven and make us loving, compassionate, caring, merciful creatures to begin with? I mean, that's a very important question. And the Quran continues to dog you with some such questions. You're forced to think about them. It doesn't let you rest, especially if you're an atheist. But in any case, if, but all you have to do is look to yourself and you begin to see the answer. Okay, we're creatures. We don't, per, per, we don't have within ourselves the perfection, the infinite perfection of love, mercy, and compassion. But nonetheless, we have it, or we could have it, to a degree where we know at least this much. From our experience of love, mercy, and compassion, we know at least this much. That you can't take a creature and program him with love. You can't take a creature and program compassion or truth in it. You can make a CAT scan that takes care of the sick, but it doesn't become compassion. You could program a computer never to make a false statement, and nobody calls it truthful. To grow in all these attributes, virtue, to grow in mercy, compassion, love, forgiveness, wisdom, knowledge, caring, all these great attributes requires three things, and perhaps more, but at least these three which are emphasized throughout the Qur'an from the very start. It requires intellect, choice, and adversity, and pain. As they say in the West, especially with exercise, physical exercise, no pain, no gain, this applies to everything. No pain, no gain. Uh, take, for example, which one was the first one I mentioned? Truth. In order to grow in truth, you have to have the option to not tell the truth. And you need the intelligence to weigh 
and figure out what are the consequences of that telling of truth. What are the material losses? What are the material benefits? And that brings us to adversity. We have to choose between being truthful or not. We have to weigh the consequences of our choice. We are rise to a higher level of truth, which is a great material loss at stake. All these three things are figured in. Compassion. You can't have compassion without suffering. You can't have compassion unless you choose, have the choice to be compassionate or to ignore. You have to be able to weigh and, and, and figure out what are the consequences of that commitment, that commitment to reach out to others. These three elements play a repeated role in our moral and spiritual growth throughout life. Same thing with forgiveness. Nobody wrongs you. It's not adversity. No one wrongs you or commits a wrong against you. Then there's nothing to forgive. But if they do, then you have a choice. And you weigh and balance the consequences of that choice. And so it is with all of them. I was talking with my wife. We were talking to my do oldest daughter. She's seven years old. Her name is Jamila. When she sees this tape, she'll appreciate this. We were talking to her not too long ago. We were telling her how when she was 11 months old, I carried her on my shoulder all night long. She was very sick, at a very high temperature. She was my first child, but I love all my children. But she was my first child. I was very worried about it. I called the doctor. We took her to the doctor. They said she was very sick, but she would eventually get over it, give her a little medication, and just be patient with her. Every time we tried to put her down, she cried. So for seven hours straight, from 11 p.m. till 6 a.m., I carried this 11-month-old child back and forth through the halls of our three-bedroom apartment, singing lullabies to her. I couldn't even stop singing. She wanted to hear it all night long. And she slept on my shoulder, and then I put her in the bed in the morning, and she was all right. I was hoarse. I was tired. My back was killing me. I had to teach in two hours. It was a miserable night. And, my, and I told her that it was. And she said, well, Daddy, I mean, were you mad at me after that? I looked at her, and I said, mad at you, honey. I mean, I couldn't have loved you more. I mean, at this stage of my life, that's one of the greatest memories I'll ever have. I'll carry it with me always. Because that is what love is. It is giving. It is suffering. It is compassion. And somehow, by some strange mechanism, it produces the most beautiful experiences in, in our life. Error plays a fundamental role in all this. We, we learn by our errors. We make mistakes and we learn. Adam makes an error, God forgives him. We make errors, God forgives us. He promises us he'll forgive us. As long as we continue to try, and as long as we learn by our errors and truly try never to give them again. But error is a fundamental role in learning. Just like it's in learning mathematics, the lessons of life are learned the same way. Error plays a fundamental role. The prophet, peace be upon him, said that if mankind see, keeps, stop sinning, stop, stop committing errors, God would face him from the earth, put another creature there that would continue to commit errors, God would conti he would continue to repent, God would continue to f forgive him, and that process would continue on. And the Quran promises us that God will forgive our errors. As a matter of fact, it promises, promises, uh, promises us that we learn and grow from our errors. It tells us that God takes our errors, our bad deeds, and he changes them into good deeds. Many Muslim authors understood it in many ways. But one possible way I think you could understand that is that when you do a bad deed, and you realize it, and truly realize it, and feel the pain of it, and have experienced its debilitating effects, then when you realize it, and truly repent, and work never to do it again, that's not just an admonition you're following anymore. That's an internalized lesson. That bad deed that you know so well and its consequences and its pain now becomes a good deed in the sense that you truly know the consequences of it, the wisdom behind it why you shouldn't do it. And you learn from it. I'm running a little bit short, so I'm going to try to tie this up right away. <clears throat> I just have to say, I can't really close this lecture without saying a few words about the next life, because it plays a big part in the Quran. So let me just tie it up very quickly. I'll get right to the point. I'll just talk about three important signs that the Quran mentions that I think is very revealing. 
least I happen to discover. I'm not insisting that this is right, but I just found it remarkable. And the three signs that the Quran talks about is, one is the sign of our lives in the womb. And it sort of draws a parallel between our life in the womb and this earthly life. Another one that just relates very close to this one, so maybe it's a subcategory of this one, is birth and resurrection. Uh, so I'll call this one. And two, another very important sign, and I haven't seen many Muslim authors write about it, frankly, but for me, it always catches my attention, is sleep and death. So I'll just very quickly say a few words about these, and then I'll, I'll close this lecture. <clears throat> the Quran frequently mentions our development in the womb. It's one of the great signs of God, one of the great manifestations of his ways and God's power. And interesting enough, there's one verse that talks about the two deaths that every individual experiences. Muslim authors differed on what that meant, but many authors, and I believe most, thought that the two deaths referred to are the death after our life in the womb, when that life ends, and now we come into this life, and which we know is an entirely different life. Even our bloodstream reverses itself entirely. Our whole stream of blood just suddenly shifts in that 10 seconds we're pulled out of the womb, turns direction, and goes in the opposite direction. But we experience two deaths. One is when our life in the womb is over, and we experience a sort of death where that life ends, and then this life begins. And so we're born. All right. And if you look at the various statements in the Quran about life in the womb, and life in this life, we see many interesting parallels, or I think they can't be missed. I'll try to get to the point quickly because I'm running out of time. But if you think about it, just as the individual grows physically in the womb, an individual grows morally and spiritually in this life. And this physical growth in the womb is fully manifested, fully visible, fully seen, in his entrance into this earthly life. What happens in the womb determines our state when we enter this earthly life. Similarly, as we grow in this earthly life, in goodness, in virtue, in kindness, or don't, that's fully manifested in the day of judgment when we enter the next life. The Quran uses very powerful language that drives home this point, that somehow our very person will manifest our moral spiritual growth in this life. I'm sure you all have your favorite references, but there's ones that say, he who does an atom's weight of good, a speck of good, will see it. It'll be, it'll be manifest, it'll be seen. He who does the atom's weight of evil will see it. It says that a person's hands and feet and skins and nose and not nose, and eyes and ears will testify to what he has become. Of course, this language is difficult because it's talking about another environment altogether. And the Quran points out that many a times that these things are similitudes, likenesses. But nonetheless, no matter how we interpret it, and there's many interpretations of it, one thing becomes clear, that somehow our very being will manifest our spiritual progress in this life. Just as our very being when we're born into this world, manifests what we did in this life, in life in the womb, what, how we grew in this life. There are uh, other references that talk about how a person's life will be an open book, which the good will hold in the right hand and the evil will hold behind their back. So the Quran makes it all perfectly clear that there's an intimate connection between our growth in this life and our entrance into the next life. And it'll be seen in our very person, what kind of person we are. In this life, we have many masks, many ways to cover what we are. We could hide our essential person, what we truly are. But in the next life, on the day of judgment, in a very objective, real way, our very being will say what kind of people we are, or were in this life. There's one verse that says, we could know them by their marks. You will know them by their marks on that day. The people above, will call down to the people below, and they will, have, they will be marked by what type of life they live. So in some 
miraculous way. Just as our growth in the womb is manifested in our person when we're born, our growth in this life is manifested in our being on the day of judgment. We'll fully show forth what type of person we were. And so while many people will say that you are what you eat in the physical realm, the Muslim might say you will be on that day what you did in this life. You will be what you do now. And a very powerful, uh, close connection. Uh, let me see. I wanted to get through the rest of these, but let's see, what else What do I want to talk about? Similarly, let's come to resurrection right, and birth. If we think about what, is it, what goes on through life as we grow, what does go on through life as we grow? We do suffer pain. Pain is a fundamental uh, aspect of life. It plays a major part in our growth. Similarly, when we go, the Quran tells us that our life in the womb, especially our birth, was a painful one. Not just for the mom. Any h husband that has watched their children be born knows that the child goes through a tremendous amount of torment too. Somehow, through pain, a child is brought from one life into another. And similarly, through pain and through work and struggle, we are brought from this life and it's manifested in our being in the next. For those people who are good, they will experience an infinite joy beyond their wildest possible imagination. And for those people that are bankrupt and evil, they will experience tremendous torment like they could never have believed. Because there, this reality is much greater than this reality. And they will suffer terribly. It would be something like this. If you somehow came through this process, and you came through it with nothing of what you need for comfort, for satisfaction into this life. Nothing to protect you from the cold, or the intense heat, or nothing. You just suffered terribly. Somehow, in the next life, the goodness that we achieve will be reflected in our very being, and our joy, and our happiness. And the evil that we achieve, if we're, in the, if we're basically evil people, will be reflected in our suffering, in our misery, in our condition in the next life. And it's so intimately connected with the type of lives we live. It's so naturally connected to how that will lead into our next life that God could say, very frankly in the Quran, and it's not we who hurt you, you hurt yourselves. And that's basically the concept of, one of the most powerful expressions of the concept of sin in the Quran is that when a person sins, yes, he harms others. Yes, he rebels against the will of God. But who does he commit tyranny against the most? Who does he do the most injustice to? Who does he hurt the most? Himself. The Quran says, it's not against us you sin, it's against your own self that you commit. And the word is tyranny oppression. When you commit wrongs, you oppress and corrupt and destroy yourself. Finally, I'm going to just wanted to talk about the sleep-death sort of parallel. It takes two minutes. <clears throat> this one I haven't seen much about, but it just fascinated me when I first studied the Quran. And it's fascinated me ever since. The Quran talks about how God takes the souls of individuals when they're asleep, when they're asleep, and how he takes them when they're dead. And he returns them to the individuals. With these on the day of resurrection. With these when they wake in the morning. And when I came across that verse, I was just fascinated. And so I started reading all the verses about the resurrection. Back to here, I guess. And how do, are the individuals, how do they seem when they rise on the day of resurrection? You can't miss the parallel. They appear as people that have just awoken from sleep. They wake up and they say, oh, not wake up, but they arise on the day of resurrection. It describes them as sort of groggy, first of all. But the second thing is, is that when they try to recall what their earthly life was like, what do they say? How long were we there? An hour? A day? Or less? Suddenly, this great reality that we're in right now, and it is reality, will seem like an illusion. All the pain, the agony, the suffering, the joys, the great things were, gra you know, the material gains suddenly seem like it was like a dream. It wasn't a dream, but it'll seem like a dream. But for those who lived a good life, it'll be manifested in their very being. But the beauty of it is, it's just like a dream. All the suffering, all the agony, all the hardship, all the struggle, all the pressure will suddenly seem like it's not very important at all. 
not very important at all. There's a saying of the prophet, peace be upon him, that when a person puts one foot in paradise, it'll, he'll, and then he's asked what sort of suffering he had in life, he won't even be able to recall it. It'll seem like it never happened. So people say time heals all wounds, resurrection heals all wounds a million times, an infinite time, infinite times more. But unless you lived a terrible life, then all your gains, all your material gains, all the things you lusted after and got, we see the parallel side of this, will seem extremely unimportant. They too will seem like an illusion. They too will seem like they're worthless. They too will seem like they were pointless. And now you're faced with the reality of what you have become. And now you're faced with your own bankruptcy. And now you're faced with the suffering that you've really brought down upon yourself. As God says, you know, he doesn't hurt anybody. You hurt yourselves. Let me see, anything else? Well, there's more I could say, but I have run out of time. But let me end as I began. I began by saying how we view another religion, unfortunately, is we're very biased by the religion, religious perspective we came from. And in one very final example, and I think it nicely ties together what I've said so far, and you have all been very patient. We're going on an hour and 25 minutes now. But this will take two minutes. One very nice example of this misunderstanding is the concept of worship. I know what you're saying. You're saying worship. I mean, Jeff, you talked about the rituals. You talked about prayers, at least. You mentioned fasting just briefly. Didn't you already speak about worship? And I'll say, no, not entirely, not even close. Because the Muslim concept of worship is much larger than rituals. Ritual is just a subset of worship. A, a subset? Yeah, you all know what a subset is, right? <laughs> okay. But it's just a subset of worship. The Muslim concept of worship is much more pervasive. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said that when a person shakes a person's hand or smiles in another's face or lifts a stone from his way so the next traveler doesn't trip on it, when a, when a, when a father gives a child a piece of food for his children to eat, or when a human being shows another even the simplest act of kindness, those are all religious acts. The actual word used was sadaka, which means not just charity, but it actually comes from a root meaning truth, which means it's an act of fidelity, an act of, an act of fidelity towards God. It has a religious content. It's a religious act. Even the companions of the prophet asked him, or he mentioned at one time, making love to your spouse is a religious act, is an act of piety. And the companions were astounded. He said, but this is very pleasurable. I mean, why should this be considered a, an act that deserves divine reward? And he said, well, when you commit adultery, isn't that an act of rebellion against God? Why does it surprise you that this is the opposite? The companions were naturally interested in what are the highest acts of worship, the highest act of, acts of self-surrender. He said that fighting in a just cause, risking your life, and dying in that just cause is even greater taking care of your parents in their old age. It's one of the great religious acts. A mother giving birth to a child and rearing a child. And if she happens to die while she's giving birth to that child, it's equivalent to if she died on the battlefield fighting in a just cause. That's how great that moment is. I'm a man, I don't understand it, but I've witnessed it. It seems like a very religious act. But in any case, the long and the short of it is that a Muslim sees all life as filled with worship, from the smallest act to the biggest act. When a taxi driver in Saudi Arabia takes you from the airport, he'll turn on the key and say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, whisper to himself. And he's saying, in the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. And when a mother picks up her crying child in, Saudi, in uh, one of the Middle Eastern countries, she'll pick the child up, and as she's grabbing him, he'll offer her a say, in the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. This is not just mere formalism. But it's become so ingrained in the Muslim personality that he understands that even the tiniest thing, positive deed, is still an act of worship and self-surrender to God. And so when the Muslim understanding, well, let me put it this way. When a non-Muslim comes across a certain verse in the Quran, they're often perplexed. And the verse I have in mind is, and I'll end with this verse, is the one where God tells mankind, I have not created man nor jinn except that they worship me. Not created mankind or jinn, other sentient beings beyond our perception, 
five senses, except that they should worship me. Many Western authors said, what does God expect us to do? Worship 24 hours a day? Does he expect us to pray in 24 hours a day and fast? We'll be dead in three weeks. But that's not the point. The point is that the Muslim concept of worship, which is so utterly pervasive, from his point of view and understanding life as he or she does, when he, she or he, he or she comes across the very same verse, the reaction is completely the opposite. It is, well, of course. I mean, what other possible purpose could he have created us for? And with that, I'll just simply say to you, peace be upon you and the mercy of God. I'm exhausted. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, I would like to thank Dr. Uh, Jeffrey Lang for this wonderful lecture and this also wonderful approach to uh, talk about uh, the purpose of life. Uh, I would like to open the floor for questions for another five hours. Is this okay, Doctor? And I would like to start myself. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning of your lecture that uh, the other religions, probably you mentioned Christian and Jewish, that uh, the purpose of life is a punishment thing and I have two philosophy here that uh, another philosophy say this life is for our enjoyment and Jesus will save us so let us use our time in enjoyment as long as our sins being already taken care of by Jesus how can we uh, have these two contradictions at this to myself point of views or philosophy that it is punishment and in the same time it's a time for enjoyment. To my humble knowledge that other religions see this word as an enjoyment time because Jesus already uh, saved us. But you mentioned in your lecture that those people saw this life as a punishment. So how can we? Thanks. So. Well, I'll, I'll just mention this much in answer to the question. Uh, more, it's a more general question, really. How can people see this life as being simultaneously a punishment and sort of an enjoyment, right? And that another person could die to, to sort of atone for their punishment, and then they could just go on and enjoy it. Uh, uh, to be completely honest with you, I, I know that some people, especially in the United States, represent that point of view. Per frankly, I don't think it's very well thought out. I think if you think about it deeply, it does have problems, and I, and, I, and I think many Western scholars of Christianity, for example, recognize that, and they realize that, that is, those issues must be tackled much more deeply. Those, that sort of perception is, is superficial and actually could be damaging. So uh, I know a lot of people hold that point of view, and even some religious leaders present that point of view, which is unfortunate. And many other religious leaders will tell you that's a very damaging point of view to represent. And that's not within the same community. It will tell you people shouldn't be saying that. Uh, for myself, when I heard people say that, frankly, it didn't make sense to me. But I'm not saying that's the perception of all people outside of the Muslim religion. But it is the perception of some. And, you know, some people have very strange ideas. Even within the Muslim community, some people have strange ideas. You know? I mean, not even, of course. You know, to be honest with you, I, the first time I, I became interested in Islam, I went around to Muslims asking them what they believed and discuss what's the meaning of life, what's the purpose of life, why, why are we here? And you'll be surprised at the strange answers I got. You know, I, I talked to many and I, I, people, I just thought nobody could make sense of this for me. And I was very, it actually put me off to even thinking deeply about Islam for another three or four years because the answers I got were so so self-contradictory. But then suddenly, you know, it's just one day, I just happened to stumble upon the Quran. A friend gave it to me. I was very curious. I didn't even know Muslims had a scripture. I began to read it, and suddenly I found that this was light years more simple and ingenious than anything that people were telling me. And, and that uh, sort of caught me. So when I became a Muslim, I really didn't become a Muslim because of some defect in some other religion. I really wasn't interested in religion at the time. I didn't want to have a religion. And, uh, you know, there's many times after I became a Muslim, I would have liked to have figured out some way I could somehow believe in this and, and not 
be a Muslim. <laughs> you know, somehow try to find some compromise because I'm basically a mathematician type, you know, skeptical. I'm quite, I just very, very skeptical and doubting. And I'm really not, never been one to want to be in a religious community. But I just found the message of the Quran so compelling, so powerful. So, it, it appealed to my reason so much that I, that I couldn't, uh, I just couldn't reject it. I thought about it for a long time before I made that decision. But I just felt I had no other choice. But a really good question, by the way. Sorry I stumbled around a bit with that. I was unprepared for it. Great question, though. This is just a very brief question. You said in the beginning that you wrote a book from the American Muslim perspective. Where can we get that? I would love my mother to read it. Well, well right now it's being considered by Oxford University Press. I sent it to them just a couple of months ago. I, they've had it a long time. I know they're reading it. It's in the hand of a reader. And I, I don't know, they might accept it. If not, I'll try New York University Press. But uh, the title of it is uh, called Struggling to Surrender. You know, because for every convert, he goes through this period of struggle. There is a struggle, really, to surrender to God. It's very, it's really a dramatic experience. So I entitled it Struggle to Surrender. If you translate it into Arabic, it has a nice meaning. Struggle to Surrender, but I don't do that. Struggle to Surrender, and then subtitled Impressions of an American Convert to Islam. If you leave me your name and address, I'll send you a copy. Okay. Oh, okay. Just give me your names. It might take time. I sort of go down the list. So, what do you think is the best mechanism of teaching children about Islam, especially four years old, five years, seven years? At bedtime or through a formal lessons? Or uh, what kind of mechanism do you think, Yanni? I'm not you spare in that. Oh, do you have children? Obviously. Seven years old. Seven years old. Yeah, I have one seven and a daughter five and a daughter three, soon to be four. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> but, but the method I like is I try to keep it natural. So that, first of all, children will come to you with many, many questions. Actually, they'll insist on you teaching them more than you probably really want to. And their questions are difficult. So what I try to do is I try to uh, keep it very natural. You know, when they ask me a question, I try to answer them in a natural way, not a dogmatic way. Not in a way that scares them or says, you have to believe this. I try to, in a very, as rational as I can, I like the rational approach, really, because the Quran puts so much stress on it. I even use a lot of examples from the Quran, you know, the sort of natural examples, the examples from nature to teach my children. If my, t if my children ask me, why are there different peoples on this earth? Why, they do ask me, why are, is not everybody Muslim dead, especially in America? Why are there so many Christians? I explained to her that God allowed us to make choices, and he has given us guidance. And we have to use our minds and our, uh, whatever sources we could get, on our, get it, our hands on to find out what is life all about and to, and to follow that to the best of our ability. And she'll ask me, well, what is life all about? And I'll answer her in a way that she could understand. It's about being good, hon. You know, I'll tell her. It's about being good and believing in God, because as the better we get, I'll tell her just what I told you guys except in a very simplistic way, not using a lot of highfalutin words, which I didn't use that much tonight anyway. And, and they appreciate it. And the interesting thing is, is that my daughter, when she discusses in school with her friends, or when she's given an opportunity to talk about her beliefs in school, the teachers even remark, my God, she makes a lot of sense. You know, she's very rational, very intelligent, very natural in her approach. And she is, and I think that's what parents have to do. Try to avoid, uh, put, especially in the United States. If you're gonna go back, in other cultures this probably works beautifully, and I, I don't, I grew up in the Catholic Church where I had things rammed down my throat. And that does work if you're in a certain environment. But in the United States, where there is so much uh, skepticism, where there's so much doubting, where there's so much challenging of your ideas, I think it's much more important to try to think of sensible answers to your children's questions. Do a lot of homework. Do a lot of research. Do a lot of reading of the Quran. Read a lot of Western, what Western writers have to say about religion. Just read, you know, as the Quran says, read, read, read. You'll find that you come to know other people's perspectives. You'll come to know what sort of questions your children will have to face. You'll come to know what they have to, what sort of questions they'll have to encounter and you'll be able to start formulating them answers for yourself, little by little by little. I think there's no better parent than a well-educated parent. 
And the, and the worst type of parent is the parent that just doesn't make any effort. Just hands the child what they had and good luck. You know, because what they had probably won't work here. It probably won't work in the next generation either, or the next. Parenting is a lot of work. You really have to prepare yourself, I think. Yes, sir. Assalamu uh, alaikum. What made you to uh, think about this topic, Islam and the purpose of life? I'm thinking about if you had some experience with your friends and um, in, in the course of your discussion, you came about uh, this type of uh, topic. Well, that is very uh, insightful. As a matter of fact, that's exactly how I uh, began lecturing on this. I was, you know, I work at a university. Most of my friends are atheists or agnostics. You know, I mean, they're university professors. What do you expect? You know, I mean, almost all university professors. I mean, you know, everybody tells us we're the best trained, we're the best educated, we're the most intelligent. You know, all these pride, you know, like I talked about in the beginning. And, and we start to believe it. You know, even though our area of research is some little tiny insignificant area of research, which that research in a nickel might get you a cup of coffee, probably won't. You know, <laughs> we, we start to think that what we know and, and what we've learned is so great. You know, and, and our minds are so great that we could just pick up out all these old wives' tales and it's all garbage. I mean, that was my mindset, and that's the mindset of most of my friends. But, and we shared it together. And most of my friends in the university are atheists. And so when I became a Muslim, the reaction was, Jeff, are you going bananas? I mean, what, what is going on? You know, are you, did you have some great psychological trauma? No, I feel fine. You know, I didn't go through any great tr psychological trauma. Did your mom die? You know, everybody was asking. But no, nothing like that happened. But I just found this message very compelling. And as much as I wanted to walk away from it, I finally just couldn't. But now they wanted to know why. So I would try, to, I would find myself explaining to them why. They would raise certain objections. I would just think for a moment and then try to answer their objections. And usually do a pretty good job. And finally, many of them would admit, well, I mean, I've got to admit this much, Jeff. It's pretty coherent and very consistent. I've got to hand it that for you. It makes a lot of sense, more sense than a lot of things I've ever heard. And that's no credit to me. It's really credit to the Quran. You know, that was exactly my reaction with the Quran. But so many of them reacted this way that I thought that I should share this perception. Even though I'm limited in my abilities, within that limited range, I should share what I at least have come to uh, feel. And so I do very very little. As Brother Hamid will tell you, I very seldom do this, maybe once or twice a semester. But I think it, I felt compelled to at least say it so that other people may listen to it and go much further with it and benefit from it, you know, if they, if they do. And if they don't, they could at least learn what Muslims believe. Yeah, thank the nice question. You look like you have a question. Do you have a question? Okay, when you're using the, the verse from the Quran where you're talking yes. about God taught Adam the names of all things. Yes. And then, um, then the, he asked the angels yes. to name them. Yes. And so Adam in turn taught the angels the names. Is that no, right? he, just, he just went ahead and named them. He named them, yeah. so he didn't teach the angels? No. So then the angels do not have the capacity of learning? Well, let's put it this way. They certainly must have some capacity of learning, because they said, we only know what you taught us. Okay. You know, so they do have some capacity to learn. At least the uh, angelic beings certainly have some capacity, or that, at least from the evidence of the Quran. But the point of the story, the point of the, the passage is, is that the, while they have some, they don't have enough to perform this feat. Then, God, then the Quran shows that Adam does. So he's superior in this category. And just in this capacity. And just to make the point absolutely clear, God has the angels where he, direct, he shows that this is an answer to this question. And then to put the exclamation mark point on the point, he goes ahead and makes them bow down to Adam. And of course, Iblis, with his great pride, cannot. You know? So it's a very, all those verses connect very nicely. Really good question. Boy, a lot of good questions here today. Usually I don't get many good ones. <laughs> Anything else? You don't have to. Yeah. <laughs> yes. 
I grew up in a Muslim society, so I didn't. Uh, I didn't uh, accept uh, religion as uh, uh, by by learning and by um, studying, uh, but uh, I learned just uh, it, it was inherited. It was inherited from my parents and society and culture. And uh, I didn't need before coming here. I didn't uh, need to to learn the reasons why these things are prohibited in Islam and why Quran said that we didn't we shouldn't do like this. But uh, I have uh, one question for just uh, about food. Mm, when I came here, I I was uh, I came across uh, uh, questions about prohibi prohibition of uh, uh, pig and pork and pork oh. products and alcohol yeah. and uh, most of uh, uh, Christian community asked me this question that why did Islam or why did Quran prohibit uh, uh, pork or alcohol what was the reason and uh, you you may have and I am confident that you have studied much more Quran in detail and uh, may, you may have a good answer for that. Not really uh, I uh Aspects about uh, you know rules and regulations of behavior, I just accept them. <laughs> you know, I'm, not, I, I'm more interested in other types of questions, not those type. So I never really study them. But I mean, you could. I mean, as far as alcohol, for example, goes. I mean, all Americans know it's it's dangerous. I mean, I'm not gonna talk from. I could just give you personal testimony from my own relatives, just how dangerous alcohol is, how it could destroy a person's life. It's a powerfully addictive drug, m more powerful than most. And while most Americans will agree that marijuana, uh, cocaine, heroin, that these are dangerous drugs and we should fight them, alcohol is every bit as dangerous and every bit as destructive. So most Americans really know it in their hearts. It's just accepted now. It's, uh, they even tried to ban alcohol back in the 30s or 20s, roaring 20s. They tried to ban alcohol, and they did. They did prohibit it for a while. But there's, it created so much crime and so much uh, uh, death and destruction that they said, we better lift it. You know, it's costing too much to fight this prohibition of alcohol. Today, you hear the same thing about drugs. It's costing us too much money to fight it. So let's make it legal. You know, but we all, but they recognize that it's it's harmful. As far as pork goes, I mean, like these things in the Quran, I just assume that they're probably not very good for you. If the Quran says that uh, you should avoid pork, you should, you should, probably not the best for you. Probably other meats are much better. And if you look at cases in the United States, I mean, if you look at the United States, anywhere in the world, of all the meats, doctors tell you that uh, you should probably avoid pork the most. You know, it's high in fat. Its fat doesn't digest well. There's always you know, lots of Americans have picked up trichinosis from not cooking it enough, or even sometimes when they go to fast food places or stuff, this is always a danger. You know, you could get very sick from eating pork. Now, if you cook it properly and correctly and, uh, and try to cut out as much fat as, as you possibly can, you may not suffer from it as much if you don't take care. But the fact of the matter is, is that there are many meats, I hope the pork producers don't get at me, but there are many meats in, in America, and the doctors will tell you, lean meats, chicken, uh, beef, if it's not fatty, that are much more healthier for you than pork. So, you know, I assume that's the general idea. That's why the Quran says you shouldn't eat it unless you can't find something else. If it comes down to your starvation, eat it. You know, but if you but it's healthier for you, it's better for you not to. And I and I believe that. You know, it doesn't. It's not a surprise to me. Did you ever eat pork? Oh no, you never did. <laughs> I mean, I've eaten pork. You know, well, not now, but I mean, I, I used to eat pork, and you, you get up from the dinner table, and you feel like you've eaten a mountain, you know, I mean, it just makes you lethargic and lazy and makes you fat, you know, I mean, really, well, I'm going to get sued by the pork producers, but, but really, uh, you know, I, I never had any problems with these things. I would just tell them that from my own point of view, I think pork, pork is probably the least healthy meat, and uh, it's probably the, and if it's the least healthy, it's probably not very good for your health. Probably it's much better to, to avoid it. And that's what Muslims do. And that's why Muslims are very healthy people. No. Just, but really, you cut out drinking and you cut out, you know, consuming a lot of pork. 
well, especially drinking. If you cut out drinking and drugs, you're going to be a lot more alert, have a lot healthier life. You know. Yes. I'm sorry that I'm not an expert on those sort of things. Uh, how about if I take one last question? Do you want to ask a question? Okay, let me take that question back there. Uh, the young lady, the, the lady, the sister back there. And then, uh, then I'll take your question. No, then, okay, this is the last question then. And thanks. Muslim very long, so I haven't been able to recite the Holy Quran and learn these things from myself. But I have heard from people that um, the people that eat pork, that uh, pork is a shameless animal, and that when you eat pork and get it into your system, it makes you shameless. Is that true or not? I never heard that before. <laughs> the shameless animal makes you shameless. I don't know if there's any chemical connection there. I'm not seeing how that would naturally go. I don't think so. I'm, I know some pretty, some pretty, uh, some some pretty shy people that that eat pork. You know? I mean, I have just heard this. So yeah. I mean, I don't know for myself. That's why yeah. I'm asking. Uh, actually, I know quite a few people that are very shy and very reserved and very nice people that eat pork. You know, maybe they'll die of a heart disease. But <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I hope not. I hope. I hope not. But. But no, I don't think so. I think it's probably just not good. From the Muslim standpoint, it's of the various meats that exist, it's the worst for you. And really, I mean, in, in many cultures, it's a real problem. You know, lots of people get terrible worms and diseases. And so, and you know, you'd be surprised at how many Americans have worms that don't know it. And that doctors tell them they pick up through things they eat. So, you know, I'm not, I'm thinking that it's probably just, I've never researched the issue, but I always <laughs> just assume that it's, it's the worst meat for you if you're going to eat meat. Yeah. Uh, I see. So accordingly, some scholar says the the uh, big themselves uh, pork. Uh, meat, uh, the pigs does not have this, uh, what we call... Uh, Discrimination? Fira, what? Not the shyness, as a matter of fact, but jealous, jealous. towards the, like the uh, people, the wives and so on. Accordingly, the people who eat that type of food will, uh, will exhibit part of that relation. And accordingly, uh, what that's what we believe is, is that what you eat also... You are uh, what you eat, then. Exhibit, <laughs> exhibit exactly. So they say the people who live around the, uh, like the uh, eating fish most of the time, they are more of light uh, soul than the people who eat camels and eat uh, other uh, right? tough, tough meats and so on. And that's uh, one theory of food, anyway. That's interesting. You know, I, I mean, I wouldn't knock it automatically. I mean, certainly people that drink a lot, they... They, they, you know, they could lead reckless lives. But of course, that's the effect of the drug. But no, I, I don't know. It's just a, I just happen to know a lot of really nice, good people. I mean, who live very, very chaste lives, who uh, who love pork. You know, they go out and eat it once or twice a week. I, I just, but you know, as it is with all uh, sort of Quranic injunctions and things like that, and uh, rules and regu and rules regulations. I just, I just follow them. I just, you know, I find that my life is uh, better. I'm happier. I, I don't need to rationalize those. You know, when I first studied religion, when I first studied Islam, I was impressed by the bigger message. You know, the message of why we are here, why we are living, what do we have to do. I thought the system was so brilliant, so consistent, that I just surrendered. You know, th the rest of it seemed, seemed to not that much of it big a deal. You know, okay, give up drinking, so what? You know, I mean, you know, probably it's not good for you, honestly. And, you know, give up pork, good. I, I like chicken better, and it's much healthier for you. You know, at least I feel it is personally. Never had a problem with the injunctions. Never felt the need to rationalize them. You know, I always say to people, what, okay, if we start eating pork, you're going to believe in our religion? <laughs> you know, no. You know, it doesn't, it has nothing to, it's not an issue, really, when it comes to ultimate questions. Uh, yes? Then I'll get you. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Alcohol. 
and uh, most of uh, m uh, Christian community asked me this question that why did Islam or why did Quran prohibit uh, uh, pork or alcohol what was the reason and uh, you you may have and I'm, I'm confident that you have studied much more Quran in detail and uh, may, you may have a good answer for that not really uh, I uh, aspects about uh, you know rules and regulations of behavior I just accept them. <laughs> you know, I'm, not, I, I'm more interested in other types of questions, not those type. So I never really studied them. But I mean, you could. I mean, as far as alcohol, for example, goes. I mean, all Americans know it's it's dangerous. I mean, I'm not going to talk from. I could just give you personal testimony from my own relatives, just how dangerous alcohol is, how it could destroy a person's life. It's a powerfully addictive drug, m more powerful than most. And while most Americans will agree that marijuana, uh, cocaine, heroin, that these are dangerous drugs and we should fight them, alcohol is every bit as dangerous and every bit as destructive. So most Americans really know it in their hearts. It's just accepted now. It's, uh, they even tried to ban alcohol back in the 30s or 20s, roaring 20s. They tried to ban alcohol, and they did. They did prohibit it for a while. But there's, it created so much crime and so much uh, uh, death and destruction that they said, we better lift it. You know, it's costing too much to fight this prohibition of alcohol. Today, you hear the same thing about drugs. It's costing us too much money to fight it. So let's make it legal. You know, but we all, but they recognize that it's it's harmful. As far as pork goes, I mean, like these things in the Quran, I just assume that they're probably not very good for you. If the Quran says that uh, you should avoid pork, you should, you should, probably not the best for you. Probably other meats are much better. And if you look at cases in the United States, I mean, if you look at the United States, anywhere in the world, of all the meats, doctors tell you that uh, you should probably avoid pork the most. You know, it's high in fat. Its fat doesn't digest well. There's always you know, lots of Americans have picked up trichinosis from not cooking it enough, or even sometimes when they go to fast food places or stuff, this is always a danger. You know, you could get very sick from eating pork. Now, if you cook it properly and correctly and, uh, and try to cut out as much fat as, as you possibly can, you may not suffer from it as much if you don't take care. But the fa fact of the matter is, is that there are many meats, I hope the pork producers don't get at me, but there are many meats in, in America, and the doctors will tell you, lean meats, chicken, uh, beef, if it's not fatty, that are much more healthier for you than pork. So, you know, I assume that's the general idea. That's why the Quran says you shouldn't eat it unless you can't find something else. If it comes down to your starvation, eat it. You know, but if you but it's healthier for you, it's better for you not to. And I and I believe that. You know, it doesn't. It's not a surprise to me. Did you ever eat pork? Oh no, you never did. <laughs> I mean, I've eaten pork. You know, well, not now, but I mean, I, I used to eat pork, and you, you get up from the dinner table, and you feel like you've eaten a mountain, you know, I mean, it just makes you lethargic and lazy and makes you fat, you know, I mean, really, well, I'm going to get sued by the pork producers, but, but really, uh, you know, I, I never had any problems with these things. I would just tell them that from my own point of view, I think pork, pork is probably the least healthy meat, and uh, it's probably the, and if it's the least healthy, it's probably not very good for your health. Probably it's much better to, to avoid it. And that's what Muslims do. And that's why Muslims are very healthy people. No, just. But really, you cut out drinking and you cut out, you know, consuming a lot of pork, well, especially drinking. If you cut out drinking and drugs, you're going to be a lot more alert, have a lot healthier life. You know. Yes. I'm sorry that I'm not an expert on those sort of things. Uh, how about if I take one last question? You wanted to ask a question? Okay, let me take that question back there. The uh, young lady, the, the lady, the <laughs> sister back there, and then uh, then I'll take your question. No, then okay. This is the last question then, and thanks. Muslim very long, so I haven't been able to recite the Holy Quran and learn these things from myself, but I have heard from people that um, the people that eat pork that uh, pork is a shameless animal and that when you eat pork and get it into your system, it makes you shameless. Is that true or not? I've never heard that before. <laughs> the shameless animal makes you shameless. I don't know if there's any chemical connection there. 
I'm not seeing how that would naturally go. I don't think so. I'm, I know some pretty, some pretty, uh, some some pretty shy people that that eat pork. You know? I mean, I have just heard this. So yeah. I mean, I don't know for myself. That's why yeah. I'm asking. Actually, I know quite a few people that are very shy and very reserved and very nice people that eat pork. You know, maybe they'll die of a heart disease. But <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I hope not. I hope. I hope not. But. But no, I don't think so. I think it's probably just not good. From the Muslim standpoint, it's of the various meats that exist, it's the worst for you. And really, I mean, in, in many cultures, it's a real problem. You know, lots of people get terrible worms and diseases. And so, and you know, you'd be surprised at how many Americans have worms that don't know it. And that doctors tell them they pick up through things they eat. So, you know, I'm not, I'm thinking that it's probably just, I've never researched the issue, but I always just assume that it's, it's the worst meat for you if you're going to eat meat. According to that type of food you eat. I see. So accordingly, some scholar says the the uh, big themselves uh, pork uh, meat uh, the pigs does not have this uh, what we call uh, discrimination fira, what, not the shyness as a matter of fact but jealous, jealous. towards the like the uh, people the wives and so on accordingly the people who eat that type of food will will exhibit part of that relation. And accordingly, uh, what that's what we believe is, is that what you eat also... You are uh, what you eat, then. Exhibit, <laughs> exhibit exactly. So they say the people who live around the, uh, like the uh, eating fish most of the time, they are more of light uh, soul than the people who eat camels and eat uh, other uh, right? tough, tough meats and so yeah. on. And that's uh, one theory of food, anyway. That's interesting. You know, I, I mean, I wouldn't 